And we are live, ladies and gentlemen. This is your friend, Charlie Hunter, wearing his glasses around his neck for some reason. Um, but out there in internet land, how are things? It's good to be here. It's good to see you all virtually. I know it's been a long time since we've had a reasonably fine art talk, but we've been very, very busy. Very, very busy. And I thought it would be fun today to talk about the uh, most recent plein air event that I did, which was the inaugural of uh, the inaugural plein air in the Smokies down there in Tennessee. And uh, I, I, I thought we'd go through what paintings were done and what the thought process in my little noggin was. But before we get going, got a couple of things, a couple of housekeeping things. One, the great Betty Sue is off um, on the roads, driving from, let's see, she did Tulsa, uh, she did Oklahoma City, she did Tulsa, she did, oh, now she's like in, in, in going over to Illinois, I think is the next show. Uh, slowly making her way up into the great Midwest, go to BettySue.com and check out and see if she's playing near you. Um, but anyway, she is not here pulling the strings today. So it's just just me. And uh, if I screw up, bear with me, because I'll be trying to monitor some comments to put up on screen if I can, and also running the slideshow. But even before we get going, I uh, want to mention a few um, self-promotion things. Uh, I've got a workshop in Fredericksburg, Texas, November 1 through 4, that is about two-thirds full. And Charbonneau, who is here and is always up for a snack. Would you like a snack, Charbonneau? No, he's busy, he's big, busy washing his hands, washing his little paws. Uh, but Charbonneau would like to have enough snacks. And uh, so we need we need to fill those, those remaining uh, spots, if, if at all possible. Just go to uh, hunterstudio.com, hunter-studio.com, and uh, look, look and pull down that workshops tab. Let's see. I'll pull up this. Um, where does it say? Yes, for more information, visit hunterstudio.com while I'm doing this blathering. Um, so, so check out the, if you're down near Fredericksburg, Texas, or would like to travel down there, it's a lovely place. Uh, Texas Hill Country will be painting outdoors uh, all day, each day, and then doing an end of day critique session. Uh, and then uh, also with Doug Fryer, I am doing an event here next May, May of 2023 called the Hunter Friar, no, the Friar Hunter Gatherings. I'm trying to make a joke on uh, hunter gatherers. The Friar Hunter Gathering, that's a juried painting colloquium. And information about that is under workshops at hunter-studio.com. And the final bit of self-promotion is my new book of sketches is finally out. Boy, was that a pain in the neck. Uh, and that is available at hunterstudio.com under the store heading. And that's 15 bucks plus uh, whatever the handling is. I think it's seven bucks for the handling. All right. Now, excuse me, Sharbo. Um, I am trying to, we're single handedly doing this, Sharbo. <laughs> uh, I am now switching back to being able to see the comments. Oh, I'm going to shut that, take, get rid of that there banner and push Charbonneau off the table, go to comments and put up the slideshow and tell you all about the Great Smoky Mountains. Here we go. Oh, that's a small view. Let's go to the bigger view. That's better. Okay, so. The Great Smoggy Mountains down there in Tennessee. Uh, it's this, they straddle the border between Tennessee and North Carolina. Uh, and the event took place, it was basically uh, centered in Maryville, Tennessee, which is a suburb. Uh, it's, a, it's the county seat of Blount County, Tennessee, but it's effectively a suburb of Knoxville. 
So one flew to Knoxville, uh, drove, picked up one's rental car, which actually said had New York plates on it. So all these people were like, oh, I didn't realize you were from New York. I'm not. I didn't realize you drove. I didn't. Uh, it just was randomly a New York rental car. Um, and then we drove from the airport to the RT, lo lo RT Lodge, which uh, it was really nice. We got put up there. We got put up for a week with our own hotel rooms. It was so cool. And that meant that at the end of the day, one would head to the tavern and see one's little friends. They had a fire pit outside so we could sit outside and talk about our experiences. Now, that it was exceptional that that occurred. And that was because Kathy Odom and Buddy Odom, Kathy and Buddy O, who we've had as guests at the Reasonably Fine Art Talk, they were hired by the Friends of the Smokies uh, to kind of advise and direct how the Friends of the Smokies were going to go about creating this inaugural plein air event. Friends of the Smokies is an amazing organization. Smoky Mountains National Park has no admission fee. It's one of the few national parks you just drive right into it. And Friends of the Smokies exists to help fundraise for what goes on at the park. Uh, they had not done this event before. None of them had any background in running a plein air event. So Kathy and Buddy O, I guess primarily Buddy, was brought on to advise them. And they did a wonderful job. It was one of the best run events I have been to. Uh, kind of astonishing that it was um, that it was the inaugural one. So the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, as I said, straddles the border between Tennessee and North Carolina. There are several entrances to it. The big commercial entrance is apparently Gatlinburg. This is the quiet side of the Smokies, as they like to say. Um, and we were given kind of specific locations that might be good to paint. One of the most visited locations in the Smoky Mountain National Park is Cade's Cove. And in mountain parlance, a cove is a relatively flat area between mountains. Um, so where, where you can find meadows. So that was where, uh, or land that could be turned into meadows. And so that was where uh, settlement occurred early on in the mountains. Um, the picture here, the showing my painting setup and the rental car and the little painting I did on the first day is deceptive because it looks like I am along a deserted country road, which I am, but it, it's one of two little cross roads in Cade's Cove. The loop of Cade's Cove is bumper to bumper automobiles. And I would have found it virtually impossible to paint along the main roads because it, it is just nonstop human beings. Fortunately, the, these two little crossroads are dirt roads that are very, very few people are on them. And that is where I painted during all of Cade's Cove. You can see where I started out. Um, if you look at the, the picture of the, the photograph of the car and the painting setup, that's my early block in stage. And then the inset is the final uh, painting. Um, as usual, my goal during these events is to paint two paintings a day. And I mostly did six by 12s. I did only if I did three uh, 12 by 24s. I like the one by two aspect ratio. I think that creates a drama. I like working monochromatically when I'm working plein air because then I can concentrate on the design and the drawings and I'm not worried about trying to get the right chroma in the right place in a limited amount of time. My palette for all of the uh, paintings that I submitted during the event itself was a mixture of ultra, <laughs> a mixture of raw umber and Van Dyke brown, my usual monochromatic 
sludge. Uh, occasionally, I put in hints of other colors, but I had neglected for some reason to uh, pack my ultramarine blue. And um, so it, it, the other colors are a little bit limited. Um, so anyway, that was day one, painting one. Now, Cade's Cove was about an hour drive from uh, the hotel. So did not have the luxury of, as those of you who know my painting routine at plein air events, my painting routine is to do a morning painting, go back and eat something for lunch, lie down, take a nap, and do an afternoon painting. Given the amount of time it would have taken to go back and forth between the park and the hotel, I just stayed in the park all day. Uh, I probably started later than many of my friends. Um, next slide, please, Charles. Day one, painting two. This is the afternoon painting, beautiful spot on Sparks Lane. That first one was called Hyatt, it was, took place at Hyatt Lane, which as I said, is where the lanes are the two little cross roads, little cross paths in the Cades Cove loop. Um, this is on Sparks Lane and it is the horse paddock. Uh, the, the, the park offers trail rides and the horses, there are about 50 horses. The horses hang out in that field. Um, this was my favorite small painting that I did during the week. And I submitted this as one of my two competition pieces. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. The thing I wanted, I would suggest anyone particularly interested in my process look at is how I am not trying to slavishly copy the organic forms but am instead just trying to get the feel of them. Uh, I would particularly direct you to the left-hand side of the photograph and of the painting, where those there are these swooping forms coming up from the lower low to, to, to high. Uh, I'm trying to just capture their feeling rather than each actual individual branch in reality. Make sense? I hope so. Here's a larger version of that, of that painting. Um, I was really happy with this. I like the way that the uh, fence line, the, the gate line breaks up. You know, it, 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 it transits us from the left-hand side to the right-hand side and has the delicious, uh, it, 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 it's like a narrative device to tie the big dark shapes together with thin little dark shapes and larger bright shapes. Um, next slide, please, Charles. Day two, painting one. Isn't it beautiful out there? Isn't that gorgeous, ladies and gentlemen? Now I was painting here and I was trying to do a literal painting and I was not getting it. I was not getting it. I was getting very frustrated. I was thinking of wiping my painting out. And then I decided to just get more abstract. Just let, rather than literally trying to depict what was in front of me, to just use what was in front of me as a portal to walk through, to play with more abstract shapes. And I ended up being very satisfied with this one. Um, this is, my usual paint mixture of the uh, Van Dyke and uh, raw umber plus transparent oxide red and olive green and a little transparent oxide yellow. And these are all Cobra water mixables. If you are looking for the analog in conventional oils, it would be the Rembrandt versions of these colors because Rembrandt pigments and Cobra pigments are the same. The only difference is Rembrandt oil paints are not water mixable and Cobra oil paints are water mixable. If you have any questions, do put them in the comments and I will, if I see them, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, keep my eye on them. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to throw them up on the, uh, on the screen, okay? Day two, painting two. This is back to Hyatt's Lane. Um, 
And right near the road of the endless tourists, uh, once again, it appears to be nicely deserted. I was paint. I was painting here actually. Took a break and was eating some pistachio. No, I was eating a granola bar. I was eating a granola bar, and I looked up, and down there by that bridge was a regular bar. And the regular bar looked at me eating the granola bar, and he said to me, "I've already made this joke, but I like it." He said, what's that? I said, it's a granola bar. He said, I'm a granola bar too. And I said, I don't think you are. I think you're a regular bar. And he said, what kind of granola bar is that? And I said, I don't know. It just says soft and chewy. And he said, well, you look kind of soft and chewy. That's not true, actually. He totally minded his own business and just shambled across the road up there. It was a lovely thing, ladies and gentlemen. It was a lovely thing. Now, some one uh, one of my painting friends did have a bear come and chase her away from her painting rig, and then he apparently tried to eat some of the paint. That didn't go over too well, I'll tell you that. Anyway, this, this painting, uh, what intrigued me and what I would suggest you look at again is what I chose to emphasize in the painting versus the reality. What intrigued me was the shape of the bridge forms and the fence row on the left, the way the fence pickets cut into, stitched into the dark shape of the foliage in the background. I didn't think it was a particularly good painting and I'm still not crazy about it, but I should never say that in public. Should never say that in public. I, sh I, 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 I should say more like, this is a study. I'm exploring. I'm exploring light and darks and uh, shapes here. So it just know when I'm saying I'm exploring, that means um, it may not be a work of staggering genius, okay? Uh, next slide, please, Charles. Okay, day three. Painting one. So we're now on Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Did my first 12 by 24. We were assigned painting locations. Uh, each of us, a group of us, were assigned to paint up in Elkmont at a place called Daisy Town. Uh, one, uh, one group was assigned Monday morning, one group was assigned Monday afternoon. One group was assigned Tuesday morning, one group Tuesday afternoon, one group Wednesday morning, and I think that was it. There were only a total of 20 of us painters, uh, so it was not a huge, it was not a huge uh, event. Um, so I went up Wednesday morning, and I had been told the light doesn't really show up uh, at Daisy Town until late in the morning. And that's good, because I'm not an early morning person. So I went up at about 11.30, I think, and the light was just getting there. So the inset is the, uh, what is called the Appalachian Club. It's basically was, Daisy Town was a group of small vernacular, well, yeah, vernacular cabins that ended up being taken over by kind of the elite of Knoxville who used them as kind of hunting and fishing uh, cabins. Uh, and the, the Appalachian Club was built as their clubhouse. Um, it's very interesting history of, of uh, how the, the, these little settlements came to be. Daisy Town, and, well, Elkmont was the terminus of the logging railroad that went from Maryville up to Elkmont, and they timbered and timbered and timbered until most of the timber was gone. And then the uh, railroad magnates uh, had the brilliant idea of turning the old working worker housing into cabins for uh, vacationers. And they started marketing the, the train, train ride from Knoxville and Maryville up to Elkmont as a scenic excursion. Uh, the, the rail line got pulled out in the depression, I think. And uh, since then, that is what the, the current road up to Elkmont, it is the old railroad grade. And you can tell it is because it just follows the river 
very, very gently uh, heading up the grade, but very, very, very twisty and turny. Um, this was a 12 by 24. I don't think it's particularly, I think it's an exploration of light and dark. Um, it was, tr I was trying very hard to draw uh, and I found it challenging um, and we'll leave it at that. This is this is where I was I was set up at the same place. Both paintings were I didn't move the car. So the previous one was looking the other direction, and this later one was the second painting on Wednesday, was looking up the hill at the little cabins. Uh, this is a six by twelve, just doing a really concentrating on the light and trying to build, trying not to think of the buildings as the buildings, but simply record the shapes of the light and dark. That's something I picked up from Richard Schmidt. And that reminds me, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to do um, the next handoff of Richard Schmidt's Alla Prima. If you're interested in being, in possessing our group copy of Alla Prima for a month, uh, you let me know, because uh, the person who has it now is eager to hand it off to the next person. Put a note in the comments, and I will see it eventually, and make a list, and I'll choose someone, and uh, we'll get your address, and it'll get sent off to you. You keep it for a month, and then we'll read the next person's name and send it off to them, okay? That's the deal. All right, back to the topic at hand. But that's what I learned from Richard Schmidt, is to think about the shapes of light rather than the object itself. And that is what allows one to let go of edges. Uh, letting go of edges to me is one of the, one of the hidden, um, one of the hidden, one of the hidden, Secrets. I don't. I don't really like that term. But one of the secrets of making successful paintings is to stop thinking about defining each object uh, as object, but instead think about how they almost blend into one another. How long would I was? Oh, oh, Jasper the cat over in England wants to know how long I would have spent on that small six by twelve. Um. They each of the six by twelves are between an hour and a half and two hours, maybe two and a half hours. Um, it's really it, it, it's amazing how little painting I get done. I really am a big believer in taking a sip of coffee, stepping back and going hmm, and trying to minimize the number of uh, actual paint strokes that are put down. Now I will say here. There was no coffee, and it was quite cold, ladies and gentlemen. It was quite cold. Okay. Next day, day four, Thursday morning, painting one. Another went back to Hyatt Lane because the bumper cars, the bumper-to-bumper -bumper cars on the uh, Loop Road at Cades, Cades Cove were unending as ever. And this day, I had been a, we, are, we had all been asked to paint at Cades Cove. Uh, so I wanted to show you, this is, this painting, what we can say is an exploration. It's an exploration of light and dark and forms. Um, the part I like of the painting is I like the lower left-hand side. I like the way that I pulled with a paper towel and really got a feeling of light there. That, that part seems successful to me. Um, so the, the color image is what I was looking at. Sometimes when I'm feeling flummoxed, I will take a snapshot and convert it to, with my phone, with the device, and I will convert it to black and white and just to, to really try to drive home to myself the consciousness of the big forms. Um, that's what I did here, and I wanted to show you, I kept, I kept that snapshot on the phone and show you how that 
translated uh, and then into the painting. I do not reference that snapshot while I'm working on the painting, it or more than once or twice, but it's not like I have the phone and then looking at it and then working on the painting. It is really just to help clarify my brain, just to use it as a tool of, okay, those are your big shapes. Make sense? All right. Next slide, please, Charles. Day four, painting two. I went back up. I went back up to Elkmont, to Daisy Town, because I would, had I felt I had more to explore. And I was quite happy with this one. This one seems to me uh, to tell the story that I wanted to tell about the Appalachian Club and its wonderful roofs and porch and the way that light was hitting it in a more coherent manner than the large 12 by 24 one. Um, I think the next slide has all, has both of them together. Let's see. Yes. Okay. So on the left here is reality. On the right, the top one is the 12 by 24. The bottom one is the 6 by 12. Obviously, different times of day because the light is quite different. So the top one is morning, the afternoon. The bottom one is afternoon. Do I use a viewfinder to crop what I'm looking at? Uh, no, I do not. Um, some people do. The thing I find disconcerting about a viewfinder, and some people don't you know, just do the thing with their hands, and um, but the thing I find disconcerting about that is when something's so close to you, it, uh, it the composition changes so radically how you how little you move the viewfinder. However, I'm not adverse to it. If if it works, for, if 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 a device works for someone, use it. That's my feeling. Um, it's not like there, when I used to hike a lot, there was a saying that people used to say, which was hike your own hike, because some people would always be policing other hikers, like, well, he blue blazed, it, which meant he took an easy trail around a challenging piece of hiking and hike your own hike. If that's what, if that, if you want to blue blaze it, blue blaze it. If you want to use a viewfinder. That's fine with me. It's just not a device I, I choose. Okay, day five, painting one. Day five was Friday, and we we were, our, our assignment was to turn in our paintings between noon and 5 p.m. on Friday. So Friday morning, I got up early for me and went up to... Uh, a campground on a very twisty little road, uh, a very narrow, very twisty little road, Metcalf Bottoms, that's what it's called, Metcalf Bottoms Campground. And I set up along the river. Uh, and again, you can see here, this shows my, my painting setup when I am at a plein air event for my ideal painting setup. I have my Soltec easel. Uh, I've got the, the fabric bag Betty Sue made uh, out of a Royal Talons kerchief we got given. And that fabric bag is where I throw my used paper towels. Um, I've got my palette uh, on the Soltec easel. The palette is a piece of plexiglass I had fit, custom cut to fit the Soltec because I don't like how the Soltec palette sits down inside the easel. Um, and then I just have the back of the car uh, is basically my work table. I've got my paper towels and brushes and all that sort of stuff on the, the floor of the car. I like getting a hatchback because if it is sprinkling rain, you can huddle under the hatchback and continue painting. If it's pouring rain, that's not going to work. But if it's sprinkling, it's going to work well. It also is very good to uh, shade you uh, so that direct sunlight isn't on your, isn't going to be on your palette or uh, on your surface while you're painting. 
I throw a windbreaker uh, over the window and kind of anchor it with the windshield wiper, the back windshield wiper, and that tends to work very well. So anyway, I was painting up here for the morning. I was feeling comfortable by this time because I'm now five days into painting, and so my eye-hand coordination is feeling pretty, um, pretty, pretty solid. Um, Metcalf bottoms, yes. Oh, hey, Kara's there. Kara, um, Kara is was was a volunteer for the event. Uh, is an avid. Uh, plein air painter and actually does encaustics as well. And one of the days I had forgotten my hat. I had left my hat at the hotel room and Kara happened by and let me borrow one of her hats. So thank you, Kara. Um, so this is the painting. Uh, it's, it's, it was just a fun, very kind of tonalist approach. By tonalism, that means you know, you, you put the slurry of paint on there and then pull all the shapes out and leaves nice kind of glowing ghosts of, of feeling of, of paint. Um, it was interesting. There was so much, so much of the Smoky Mountains is the green tunnel and rivers, um, organic forms, very little built environment, at least where we were painting. And that was a, that's a challenge for me because I tend to use a lot of architectural elements in my paintings and my brushes reflect that. I use a lot of flats. I had not brought a lot of rounds. I had my rigor, but when you're doing a 12 by 24, it's really hard to do a lot of trees with a rigor. Uh, oh, it wasn't you who did encaustics? I'm sorry, Kara. Someone else did encaustics. Um, another one of the volunteers. My apologies. Um, anyway, so this I got done in the early afternoon, uh, went back, um, turned in my paintings. You can see in the previous slide in the back of the car, my the, the finished paintings that are, are curing. Um, turned the paintings in at like 4 p.m. Uh, and then um, I think, oh, there was a reception we were supposed to go to. Um, after that. Next morning, Saturday morning, the quick paint, and it was pouring rain, ladies and gentlemen. It was pouring rain in Maryville, Tennessee, and the challenge, the challenge normally when painting is first you find the shade, then you find the composition. In this case, it was first you find the shelter, then you find the composition. And in the 1970s, Maryville, Tennessee, decided that uh, the way to the future was to turn its main street into a pedestrian mall. And they constructed kind of a one-way loop around the town and put parking garages strategically uh, around that loop. That didn't work. And in the 90s, I think, they went back to, they, they pulled out the pedestrian mall. But the... Um, the, the parking garages remain. And I found this completely deserted parking garage with a view over uh, the green belt and decided, well, I am going, I've got a great location. Now I just have to find the composition. And I'm very pleased with this device I just used. Actually, I'm gonna to go to um, big screen here. Okay, look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Hey. So that was, the, here's a picture of the car, my painting set up, and what I was looking at. This isolates what I made into my composition. One more time, just because I'm so darn pleased with it. And so I made this painting. And this, this is sort of my, I think this is my favorite painting that I did during the week. Um, it came together really well. It, it marches across the, the space. It occupies its space with authority. And I like my drawing. I like the way the roads in the foreground come in and bend and the way that the fence leads the eye to the focal point of the painting, which is the darkest dark area. That is the girders of that bridge. 
Um, the paint mixture here, because it was so misty and gray, and you know, you know, a digital camera is always going to punch up the the, the contrast. Um, it was, trust me, it was rainy, it was misty, it was gray. Um, so I mixed a bunch of unbleached titanium uh, in with my, with predominantly raw umber. And it gives this beautiful, I think it's a beautiful uh, brownish, brownish gray tone. It's more opaque than obviously because it's unbleached titanium. It's more opaque than the normal plein air mixture I use, uh, but it made me want to play with that that color mixture again uh, more often. And then we took our paint that so we did it from nine to eleven, and then we hustled back to uh, the the check in place, put put our paintings in a frame, took our easels, turned them into display easels. It had stopped raining by that time, so we were out in front of this amphitheater, and but it was still cold and gray. And we put up our paintings. The open quick paint people, that is the unjuried uh, artists, they put up their paintings. Us juried artists judged the unjuried artists. The unjuried artists judged the juried artists, and. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get the gold, the blue ribbon on that one. That made me very happy. Um, here's the next slide. Oh, yeah. Then that night, there was the gala. And boy, oh, boy, I got to, oh, any tips? Any tips for framing a wet painting from the quick paint? Yeah, Tara, I use, um, I use, what are they called? Ambiance. Ambiance Gallery. Where's my brain? Ambiance uh, wood frames from Jerry, that I get from Jerry's Artorama. Uh, what I like about them is that they have clips on the back, so you don't need to worry about having a point shooter to anchor the painting into the uh, into the frame. Um, you just clip it in. It's very, very quick. They're inexpensive frames. They're not dramatic at all. They're just plain wood. Uh, I stain mine now, uh, but it's they're, they're, it's a simple way to, uh, to, to deal with needing to pop a painting into a frame quickly. Um, this is, a, okay, so that night there was the gala. The, the thing that had been terrifying, I'm gonna put my face big again. The thing that had been terrifying about the event to date was that at the quick paint, there was no, there were just painters. There was very, very few members of the public there. And we were all like, oh no. And we'd also all brought down, they'd asked us to bring four paintings, uh, four previous paintings for them to put up in a pop-up show that would be up all that week. And those paintings obviously were for sale as well. And like none of them had sold and no paintings had sold at the quick draw. And so we were like, oh, this event may be very well intentioned, but maybe lacking sales. Not so, ladies and gentlemen, not so. At the gala, paintings were fairly flying off the shelves. Um, they did a beautiful job. They had the we had each been tasked with uh, choosing two pieces to be competition pieces. Those competition pieces were in one room that looked like a looked like a museum art gallery, and this had took place in the arts building at Maryville College, a Presbyterian uh, college down in 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 Maryville that was is was very, was a wonderful place. The, the art center was a great place to, uh, to, to have the event. So the, the competition pieces were in what looked like a formal art gallery. And then the non-competition pieces were on racks in the big room where they had all the hors d'oeuvres and the adult beverages and the Celtic band playing um, 
because we all know it's so much fun to shout over a band that's playing. But um, it was it was a sales event, ladies and gentlemen. And it was very nice for me because I got to be the it boy. And if at age 60 plus, you get to be the it anything, that's pretty darn nice. Uh, my paintings, all my paintings sold within, I think, 25 minutes. Um, and that was that was lovely. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, just showing you the picture. Um, this is the black circle on the uh, upper left shows where the uh, housing was, where the gala was. Then following um, Route 321 to Townsend, that was about 20, 25 miles. And then very, very twisty roads. Uh, the purple circle shows Cades Cove. And the red circle shows Elkmont, where Daisy Town was. And the little yellow circle shows Metcalf Bottoms uh, uh, campground, where I did the bridge painting. Uh, but those twisty roads, they are very, very, very twisty. Um, but it is beautiful. It's, look how little of the park we actually explored. Now, Carl Bretzky did go, uh, he drove to Klingman's, uh, Klingman's Dome, which is at Newfound Gap, which is sort of right in the center of the park. And that was an hour and a half from Maryville. Um, but there's so much, so much more to explore there, though there aren't a lot of roads going into it. And a lot of the topography, the challenge that they're going to have with this event is that so much of what is visible from the road is basically the same thing, which is river with trees arching over it. I think they're, they'll, in the future, they'll probably um, move to having a day of painting in surrounding communities. Um, It'll be interesting to see how they grow it, but they're very, very smart. And I think they will succeed in making this one of the real premier uh, plein air painting events. Uh, I would urge folks to apply. Uh, you can apply for next year now. Uh, just go to onlinejurydshows.com and scroll down, or you can visit um, Friends of the Smokies, friendsofthesmokies.org. Um, they don't have the link there yet, but they say they are going to in the next day or two. Anyway, that was that was my first go around um, with this event. Uh, what did uh, let's see? What did Hector have to ask? Oh, it was just a, thank you, Hector. Everybody knows Hector. He's the 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 new the new it boy, the new resident badass on the block. Um, yeah, well, there wasn't a lot of architecture there, Hector. That was the <laughs> the problem. Um, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we'll, we'll see you next week. Don't know what I'm going to do the, the, the reasonably fine art talk about, but uh, we, will, we will come up with something. Until then, you take good care. Again, put your name down in the comments if you're interested in getting the, um, the Richard Schmidt Alla Prima for a month, and uh, you take good care. All right, we'll see you next go-round. Bye-bye.